Lesson 4 Witnesses of Christ as the Messiah Sabbath Afternoon October 19 All the rays of light shining in the scriptures point to Jesus Christ and testify of Him, linking together the Old and New Testament scriptures. Christ is presented as the author and finisher of their faith, himself the one in whom their hopes of eternal life are centered. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ is the knowledge of the Father, and Christ is our great teacher sent from God. Christ has declared in the sixth chapter of John that he is that bread sent down from heaven. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 383. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, Ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness of the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He appeals to them to recall the deep conviction that was upon them under the messages of John. He said, He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. The witness of the Father had been given, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and, lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Signs of the Times, November 13, 1893, paragraph 2. In entering upon the great work of his earthly life, Jesus chose five disciples, John, Andrew, Simon, Philip, and Nathaniel. These men were called from their humble occupations to accompany the Savior in his ministry, receive his divine teachings, and witness his mighty miracles, that they might publish them to the world. There was to be a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The parties were relatives of Joseph and Mary. Christ knew of this family gathering and that many influential persons would be brought together there. So in company with his newly made disciples, he made his way to Cana. As soon as it was known that Jesus had come to the place, a special invitation was sent to him and his friends. This was what he had purposed, and so he graced the feast with his presence. Redemption or the Miracles of Christ, the Mighty One, page 3. Sunday, October 20. The Testimony of John the Baptist There was a great work appointed for the prophet John, but there was no school on the earth with which he could connect. His learning must be obtained away from the cities in the wilderness. The Old Testament scriptures, God, and the nature which God had created were to be his study books. God was fitting John for his work of preparing the way of the Lord. His food was simply locusts and wild honey. The customs and practices of men were not to be the education of this man. Worldly engrossment was to act no part in the formation of his character. He sought the favor of God, and the Holy Spirit rested upon him and kindled in his heart a glowing zeal to do the great work of calling the people to repentance and to a higher and holier life. John was fitting himself, by the privations and hardships of his secluded life, to so control all his physical and mental powers that he could stand among the people as unmoved by surrounding circumstances as the rocks and mountains of the wilderness that had surrounded him for thirty years. Ellen G. White Comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentaries, Volume 5, page 1115.
The childhood, youth, and manhood of John had been characterized by firmness and moral power. When his voice was heard in the wilderness saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, Satan feared for the safety of his kingdom. The sinfulness of sin was revealed in such a manner that men trembled. Satan's power over many who had been under his control was broken. He had been unwearied in his efforts to draw away the Baptist from a life of unreserved surrender to God, but he had failed, and he had failed to overcome Jesus. In the temptation in the wilderness, Satan had been defeated, and his rage was great. Now he determined to bring sorrow upon Christ by striking John, the one whom he could not entice to sin, he would cause to suffer. The Desire of Ages, page 224. John's testimony had been positive, had been given in the demonstration of the Spirit and with power. He had testified of what his eyes had seen, of what his ears had heard, of what his hands had handled, of the word of life. Jesus said, There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. The scribes and Pharisees had believed the words of John at the time, but pride and unbelief worked in their hearts after Satan's order, and envy, jealousy, and downright hatred of Christ were revealed. Jesus said to his disciples, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my Father. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Signs of the Times, November 13, 1893, paragraphs 3 and 4. Monday, October 21. The Lamb of God. When at the baptism of Jesus John pointed to him as the Lamb of God, a new light was shed upon the Messiah's work. The prophet's mind was directed to the words of Isaiah. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7. During the weeks that followed, John, with new interest, studied the prophecies and the teaching of the sacrificial service. He did not distinguish clearly the two phases of Christ's work, as a suffering sacrifice and a conquering king, but he saw that his coming had a deeper significance than priests or people had discerned. When he beheld Jesus among the throng on his return from the desert, he confidently looked for him to give the people some sign of his true character. But no word was spoken, no sign given. Jesus did not respond to the Baptist's announcement of him, but mingled with the disciples of John, giving no outward evidence of his special work and taking no measures to bring himself to notice. The Desire of Ages, page 136. The next day John sees Jesus coming. With the light of the glory of God resting upon him, the prophet stretches out his hands, declaring, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is become before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, for this cause came I baptizing in water. I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize in water, he said unto me, Upon whomsoever thou shalt see the Spirit descending and abiding upon him, the same is he that baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John chapter 1, verses 29 to 34, Revised Version, Margin. The Desire of Ages, page 137. John knew that it was the world's Redeemer whom he had baptized. The Holy Spirit rested upon him, and with outstretched hand, pointing to Jesus, he cried, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. None among the hearers, and not even the speaker himself, discerned the import of these words, the Lamb of God. Upon Mount Moriah, Abraham had heard the question of his son, My father, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? The father answered, 
My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Genesis chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. And in the ram divinely provided in the place of Isaac, Abraham saw a symbol of him who was to die for the sins of men. The Holy Spirit through Isaiah, taking up the illustration, prophesied of the Savior. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 6. The Desire of Ages, page 112. Tuesday, October 22. The Two Disciples of John. Peter, James, and John sought every opportunity of coming into close contact with their master, and their desire was granted. Of all the twelve, their relationship to him was closest. John could be satisfied only with a still near intimacy, and this he obtained. At that first conference beside the Jordan, when Andrew, having heard Jesus, hurried away to call his brother, John sat silent, wrapped in the contemplation of wondrous themes. He followed the Savior, ever an eager, absorbed listener. John's was a nature that longed for love, for sympathy, and companionship. He pressed close to Jesus, sat by his side, leaned upon his breast. As a flower drinks the sun and dew, so did he drink in the divine light and life. In adoration and love, he beheld the Savior until likeness to Christ and fellowship with him became his one desire, and in his character was reflected the character of his master. Education, page 87. Leaving John, the two went to seek Jesus. One of the two was Andrew, the brother of Simon. The other was John the Evangelist. These were Christ's first disciples. Moved by an irresistible impulse, they followed Jesus, anxious to speak with him, yet awed and silent, lost in the overwhelming significance of the thought, Is this the Messiah? Jesus knew that the disciples were following him. They were the first fruits of his ministry, and there was joy in the heart of the divine teacher as these souls responded to his grace. Yet turning, he asked only, What seek ye? he would leave them free to turn back or to speak of their desire. Of one purpose only were they conscious. One presence filled their thought. They exclaimed, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? In a brief interview by the wayside, they could not receive that for which they longed. They desired to be alone with Jesus, to sit at his feet and hear his words. He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day. Lift him up, page 168. If John and Andrew had possessed the unbelieving spirit of the priests and rulers, they would not have been found as learners at the feet of Jesus. They would have come to him as critics to judge his words. Many thus closed the door to the most precious opportunities. But not so did these first disciples. They had responded to the Holy Spirit's call in the preaching of John the Baptist. Now they recognized the voice of the heavenly teacher. To them the words of Jesus were full of freshness and truth and beauty. A divine illumination was shed upon the teaching of the Old Testament scriptures. The many-sided themes of truth stood out in new light. The Desire of Ages, page 139. Wednesday, October 23. Philip and Nathanael. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Philip obeyed the command, and straightway he also became a worker for Christ. The Desire of Ages, page 139. Philip called Nathanael. The latter had been among the throng when the Baptist pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God. As Nathanael looked upon Jesus, he was disappointed. Could this man, who bore the marks of toil and poverty, be the Messiah? Yet Nathanael could not decide to reject Jesus, for the message of John had brought conviction to his heart. 
At the time when Philip called him, Nathaniel had withdrawn to a quiet grove to meditate upon the announcement of John and the prophecies concerning the Messiah. He prayed that if the one announced by John was the Deliverer, it might be made known to him, and the Holy Spirit rested upon him with assurance that God had visited his people and raised up a horn of salvation for them. The message, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, seemed to Nathanael a direct answer to his prayer. But prejudice arose in Nathanael's heart. He exclaimed, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip entered into no controversy. He said, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. In surprise, Nathanael exclaimed, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. It was enough. The divine spirit that had borne witness to Nathanael in his solitary prayer under the fig tree now spoke to him in the words of Jesus. Though in doubt and yielding somewhat to prejudice, Nathanael had come to Christ with an honest desire for truth, and now his desire was met. His faith went beyond that of the one who had brought him to Jesus. He answered and said, Rabbi, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Lift him up. Page 81. If Nathaniel had trusted to the rabbis for guidance, he would never have found Jesus. It was by seeing and judging for himself that he became a disciple. So in the case of many today whom prejudice withholds from good, how different would be the result if they would come and see! While they trust to the guidance of human authority, none will come to a saving knowledge of the truth. Like Nathaniel, we need to study God's Word for ourselves and pray for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. He who saw Nathaniel under the fig tree will see us in the secret place of prayer. Angels from the world of light are near to those who in humility seek for divine guidance. The Desire of Ages, pages 140, and 141. Thursday, October 24. The Witness of Nicodemus. The great truth of the conversion of the heart by the Holy Spirit is presented in Christ's words to Nicodemus. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. John chapter 3 Verses 3 to 8, margin. Christ's Object Lessons, page 98. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, and with others had been stirred by the teaching of Jesus. As he had witnessed Christ's wonderful works, the conviction had fastened itself upon his mind that this was the scent of God. Too proud openly to acknowledge himself in sympathy with the Galilean teacher, he had sought a secret interview. In this interview, Jesus had unfolded to him the plan of salvation and his mission to the world. Yet still Nicodemus had hesitated. He hid the truth in his heart, and for three years there was little apparent fruit. But while Nicodemus had not publicly acknowledged Christ, he had in the Sanhedrin council repeatedly thwarted the schemes of the priests to destroy him. When at last Christ had been lifted up on the cross, Nicodemus remembered the words that he had spoken to him in the night interview on the Mount of Olives. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John chapter 3 verse 14. And he saw in Jesus the world's Redeemer. With Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus had borne the expense of the burial of Jesus. 
the disciples had been afraid to show themselves openly as Christ's followers, but Nicodemus and Joseph had come boldly to their aid. The help of these rich and honored men was greatly needed in that hour of darkness. They had been able to do for their dead master what it would have been impossible for the poor disciples to do, and their wealth and influence had protected them in a great measure from the malice of the priests and rulers. The Acts of the Apostles, page 104. There are very many who claim to serve God, but who have no experimental knowledge of Him. Their desire to do His will is based upon their own inclination, not upon the deep conviction of the Holy Spirit. Their conduct is not brought into harmony with the law of God. They profess to accept Christ as their Savior, but they do not believe that He will give them power to overcome their sins. They have not a personal relation with the living Savior, and their characters reveal defects both hereditary and cultivated. The only hope for these souls is to realize in themselves the truth of Christ's words to Nicodemus, Ye must be born again. Except the man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verses 7 and 3, margin. Christ's Object Lessons, page 48. For further reading, That I May Know Him, Wounded for Our Transgressions, page 67, and Selected Messages, Go Under the Fig Tree, book 1, pages 414 and 415.